Following a busy June of filming and a not so productive July, partly due to technical problems, a minor drone crash required waiting for spare parts. And so, as to maintain content for my wonderful subscribers, I set about filming what I thought would be a quick but interesting spur line off the Cambrian rail line, the Miao the Way Railway, a short seven mile track that went from Chemice Road to Dainas Miao the Way. However, August ended up being a washout and too windy, and there appeared to be no trace of the track when I finally went out filming. But ultimately, the story behind this lost railway is an ideal theme for a screenwriter, for a successor to Stanton Abbey, a story of wealth, failure, and ultimately tragedy. When I set out to film, my first put of call for research is the OS Explorer maps. At two and a half inches to the mile, they are detailed enough but cover a big enough area, and they're also available to take out into the field. As you can see, the route on the line is not all there. My next stop is the National Library of Scotland, and there's a link in the description, and the six inch to one inch mile maps that date from the middle and late 19th century, which are perfect for lost railway hunting. You can order paper copies, but at £20 a pop, they're not viable. But it's easy enough to transfer data to the OS Explorer or Land Ranger map, or to a Google map, which is only useful if there's a signal in the area I'm filming in. Starting at Kermais Road, after picking up the original course of the railway, the first stop is a village of Kermais. There's no station, just a platform, and you can make out some of it, and you can make out the remains of the bridge that went over the River Dovey. The landowner, Sir Edmund Buckley, had this standard rail line constructed in 1867, following the Act of Parliament of 1865. The railway's main purpose was to serve the local booming slate trade that had started around 1850. It was reasonably busy, but in the turn of the century saw a decline in the fortunes of the slate trade, and in 1909 the Cambrian Railways adopted the route, but war impacted on its potential as a little tourist route. Great Western took control in 1919 as part of consolidation, and with local bus services, passenger services ceased in 1931. By 1939, slate had been entirely replaced with agricultural and forestry trade. In 1950, flooding of the Dovey damaged the bridge near Chemice Road. With the repairs uneconomical, the line was closed, the track being lifted in 1952. A joy of the old maps is the amount of lost detail. In this area, it's the slate workings and the industrial heritage. Slate has been used since Roman times, the Roman fort at Carnarvon using slate rather than clay tiles for roofing, but it was only the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the need to roof whole new cities that the slate boom took off in Wales. Despite most of the hills in mid Wales and the foothills of the Snowdonian Mountains looking like slate, they are in fact mudstone, sedimentary rock that was mud laid down in shallow seas in the Ordovician period about 450 million years ago. To become slate, this mudstone had minor metamorphic action. It's been squeezed, changing the direction of the grain of the rock from horizontal to vertical by tectonic collisions of England and Wales crashing 
very slowly I may add, into Scotland. Pockets of Hearts Lake can be found in the mudstone, and this area has seams that run east to west, heading off to Corris, which is in the next valley, and which has its own rail line that still runs along some of the original length. At Aberangar, a tramway led up the valley to the hand of the slate quarries. The B road to Corris follows its course, and a little detour takes you up to the workings. Follow this forestry track past old industrial buildings, and look out for warning signs. You can find great caverns where workers mined out the seams of slates. The Hendra of the Slate Works was one of several serviced by the tramway that was dendritic in form, and expanded under the Hendra of the Slate and Slab Company, established by Sir Edmund Buckley in 1864, and it specialised in billiards tables, which will require their own specially designed tram trucks. Further up, you can follow the forestry track that sits on the original tram track bed to more extensive workings in the hills. In the First and Second World War, and after the closure of the slate quarries, the track bed had jubilee track laid for extraction of timber for the war effort. The horses and gravity that shifted the slates and slabs replaced with small engines. Now the village of Aberangal, tracking the course of the line becomes blurred again. There was a small station, and you can make out the remains of another bridge. The next section is difficult to make out, the line being between the old road and the river. On the east side of the valley is the more recent A470, Wells is Route 66, and considered one of the best roads for views in the country. A small information sign in the village says it's a post road, and whilst it didn't improve access, the new road also brought with it highwaymen. Further up the valley, at the Pass of the Cross, and I'm not even going to attempt the Welsh, there's a long tradition of banditry. I have not found much history of when the road was built. It's not a toll road that would have an Act of Parliament, and it's on maps dating from 1850. I use the road frequently, and have until filming this railway not used the old road, and there is a little surprise. The River Dovey is really quite stunning here.
As we approach Minyagwe, we come to the old slate mines, and they are worth the detour. Just as the slate trade started in 1850, the industrialist Sir Edmund Buckley, self-made millionaire, dubbed the richest man in Manchester, who also became a Conservative MP, bought the lordship of Dinas Miaudoué and the 12,000 acre estate in 1856, building the line to connect the tram lines to the new town Macunthaleth line and then on to the English markets. Edmund died the year the rail line was completed in 1867 and his bastard son, Edmund Peck, who adopted the name Buckley, inherited his father's considerable wealth and lordship title as the first baronet, which was awarded to him in 1868. I was recently up in the Highlands, and a joy of the landed gentry, it seems, that you could have a stunning stately manor in the wild as a getaway, and your own railway station to ensure one's shooting party's guests could easily get up from the smoke. This is Duncraig Castle and Duncraig Railway Station, built by Sir Alexander Matheson, first baronet in 1866, who made his fortune in the opium trade. He also had the assets in the railway and built his own private used railway station. Perhaps the young Edmund first baronet may have been inspired by Alexander, as in the following year he set about building an estate fit for a lord. The manor house called the Palace, the Plas in Welsh, that was completed in 1872, and in 1873, he built an hotel, modestly calling it the Buckley Arms Hotel, and reputedly the first reinforced concrete building in Europe, as well as other works including upgrading the railway station, and promoting the area as a kind of little alpine retreat. However, in 1876, the slate trade saw a slump, and it appeared Edmund's grand building projects and other investments had overreached his considerably deep pockets and was a staggering half a million pound in debt. That's about 50 million in today's money. Forced to sell off most of his assets and other estates, he retained the palace and the railway, although had no money to maintain it. In 1892, another slate quarry opened in the mountains as part of the Hendra the complex, bringing a promise of additional revenue. However, by this time, the infrastructure of the railway was considerably worn 
and Buckley had no funds to repair any of it. Turn of the century, the slate industry was in decline. Passenger services were suspended pending repairs in April 1900. Buckley offered the entire railway to the Cambrian Railways for £12,000, but the Cambrian did not have the capital reserves to make the purchase. A single daily freight train continued to run until 1908, at which point all services were abandoned due to the poor state of the track and locomotives. Edmund Buckley died in 1910. His eldest son from his first marriage, also known as Edmund Buckley, inherited the title and debts. He disappeared off to British Columbia in 1902, only returning after his father's death. The stately home of the Plas going up in flames in 1917, with Edmund, aged 58, dying a couple of years later with no heir. His half-brother from his father's second marriage, also called Edmund, died of battle in Gallipoli in 1915, aged 29. The ruins of the plants were demolished in 1960. You can walk around the remains of the gardens. The only memory are some wild garden shrubs, a number of innovative concrete structures like coal frames, and the surviving gatehouse. So there you have it, a story of wealth, bankruptcy, steam, slate, splendour and failure. If anyone fancies penning a blockbuster series for Netflix, to follow on from Downton Abbey, then the story of the Edmund Buckleys, perhaps with different names, will be as good a place as anywhere to start. So I hope you enjoyed the trip. Do the usual things and hit those buttons and leave a comment.